Good morning. I'm Pastor Wong. Let me welcome you to join our Sunday service. We have a two-way relationship with God. We worship Him through our singing, right life, and service for Him. He speaks to us through His Word. We must always worship Him. We worship God non-stop because He loves us non-stop. He never stops helping us. He never stops protecting us. He will be with us until our last breath. Let us be grateful and worship Him wholeheartedly. Let me say the opening prayer. Lord, thank you for your great love and mercy. You have saved us through the rebirth that comes through your word and the Holy Spirit. You have given us your word that enables us to know who you are. Your word is truth. May your Holy Spirit continue to reveal your truth to us. Help us to work in the truth. Thank you for your love and mercy. You have blessed us in so many ways. Our career, business, studies, marriage, health, friends, protection, and travels. We can never thank you enough. Here, we just want to say thank you. May your name be exalted above the heavens. May your kingdom come and that will be done in our lives. We commit our lives to you. May you continue to teach and transform us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will sing two songs today. The first song is Hosanna and the second song is King of Kings Majesty.
We will pray for the COVID-19 situation. I want everyone to say the prayer with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for your mercy and faithfulness. We ask you to have mercy on the people of the world who are living in sin and unbelief. Please work actively to save them. Open their spiritual eyes that they may understand that Jesus is the true Savior. We ask that you will comfort those who have lost their loved ones. Give strength to the medical staff to care for and treat the patients. Please protect them. Help the scientists to find effective medicine to treat this virus. Protect us and your people from the virus. Give us the spirit of faith and not the spirit of fear. Please restore the economy of a nation so that there might be jobs for the people and food for the families. We pray that our children can go back to school to resume their studies. Help them to learn well. O oh Lord, we appeal to you for your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message is Handling False Prophets. I base my message on 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. Hong Kong. What comes to your mind when Hong Kong is mentioned? Good food? Bruce Lee? Jackie Chan? Cape Pacific? Hong Kong Shanghai Bank? For others, it could be riots and demonstrations. In Hong Kong, there is a strange regulation. People 16 years above cannot carry 1.8 kg of infant formula within a 24-hour period. 1.8 kg of infant formula is two tins. They introduced this rule in the year 2013 and it remains in force until today. You might wonder why the Hong Kong government wants to micromanage the new mothers or the family members. The government introduced this regulation to overcome a severe shortage of infant milk powder in Hong Kong. Many mainland China traders and tourists bought a lot of baby milk powder sparking a severe shortage in Hong Kong. You might wonder how China, being such an advanced country, couldn't produce enough of such a simple product as milk powder for the citizens. In the year 2008, an enormous food scandal broke out in China. About 300,000 babies came down ill after consuming milk powder, manufactured by the Chinese company. The manufacturer had added a kind of chemical called melamine. They added melamine to increase the nitrogen content of diluted milk to give it appearance of higher protein content in order to pass quality control. Eight children died of kidney stones and kidney damage. 54,000 were hospitalized. Because of the scandal, many Chinese lost confidence in China produced milk powder. What we drink or eat matters. There is a saying, you are what you eat. Likewise, you need to watch out for what kind of spiritual food you are consuming. Who are you listening to? If you receive wrong teachings or embrace wrong theology, you may suffer spiritual death. You may lose your faith and eternal life. Let's read 1 John chapter 4, verse 1-6. to Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Let's read verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. During the time of John, 
The believers face a clear and present danger. Many false prophets were moving about, and the believers encounter the actual risk of being deceived by the false prophets. At that time, their house churches, the New Testament had not been completed yet, it was still being written. They didn't have any guidebook, manual, or book of discipline. They had itinerant preachers. If they wanted to check the integrity of some preachers, they had no telephone or WhatsApp to use to contact apostles. They had to write letters or send emissaries. That might take weeks or months. In view of the limitations, some Christians might get deceived by false prophets or teachers. Do we still have false prophets today? Yes, there are. There's one in Taiwan. He's the head of a Chinese church. There are members in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia. He said that every church age has a prophet, and he's the prophet for this church age. He thought that Mount Zion in Israel has been replaced by another mountain in Taiwan. Some preachers have been guilty of making false prophecies or giving prophecies that didn't happen. I'm sure you still remember MH370. The Mars aircraft disappeared on 8th of March in the year 2014. The aircraft was bound for Beijing, but for some reasons that remain unknown, it reversed direction and flew to the Indian Ocean. Obviously, it crashed into the Indian Ocean. On 15 March, in the year 2014, a famous African preacher prophesied that they would find the aircraft within days. Six years had passed, and despite two big undersea searches, the plan hasn't been found. At the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic in mid-March, someone sent me a video when an American preacher boldly predicted that the pandemic would stop by the end of April. It's July now and the World Health Organization says that the pandemic is still accelerating worldwide. The Bible has given serious warnings to false prophets or to those who make false prophecies. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 20 to 22 But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded him to say, or the prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know? when a message has not been spoken by the Lord. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. The Bible says that false prophets are directed or influenced by lying spirits. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 18 to 22 The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? Micah continued, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, with all the hosts of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. By what means? The Lord asked. I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. We may wonder why God who is holy can send an evil spirit. But God is sovereign. Sovereign means he is in absolute control and can do all things. Therefore, we should not be surprised that he can also use evil spirits to execute his agenda. Despite the existence of false prophets or false prophecies, we can't deny the fact that they are genuine prophets. I believe that God still sends prophets to the church, not to give new scriptures, but to encourage and guide his people. I will give my personal example. God used a prophetic way to guide me to start BM Bright Star. But let me clarify that I didn't rely solely on the prophetic way, but on other ways, such as peace, the word of God, and the views of other mature believers. We started BM Bright Star on 1st October in the year 2016. Two months before its establishment, 
In a prayer meeting on one Wednesday night in July 2016, God showed me a vision to a brother. In a vision, he saw a thorn bush. The thorn bush was without leaves, but there was a small flower bud and a maple leaf at the base of the thorn bush. The bud was dark purple, and the maple leaf was green in color. A few months after we established BM Bright Star, a sister in another church who had been praying for me saw another vision: the flower has blossomed. False prophets can look awesome. They use phrases like "Thus says the Lord." The Lord shows me a vision about you, or the Lord tells me to say this to you. They might claim that they have seen people healed through their prayers. We are afraid that if we don't obey, we will come under God's judgment. John tells us not to be gullible, not to be easily taken in by the claims of false prophets. He advises us to test the prophets. John says that there are two tests that we can apply. The first test is to test the messenger, to ask them what they think of Jesus. Let's read verses two and three. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. John says, "Ask them if they believe that Jesus has come in the flesh." If they deny that Jesus is human, they are not genuine. They are not sent by God, but by the devil. Some dog breaks are very aggressive. Among them are the pit bulls, rottweilers, German shepherds, and mastiffs. In the U.S., some aggressive breaks are even uninsurable. Their aggression is the nature. Satan and the evil spirits hate God. That's the nature. They are always against God. They will always act against the truth. They will definitely reject the truth of the humanity of Jesus, because the humanity of Jesus is a vital component of God's salvation plan. Let me explain why the humanity of Jesus is a critical part of God's salvation plan. Because Jesus is human, he has died a physical death. He has been judged for our sins. Because he has satisfied God's demand for our sins to be punished, we have been forgiven of our sins, and we have relationship with God. Because Jesus is human, his resurrection is physical, and he could give us physical resurrection in the future. If Satan and his servants can get people to believe that Jesus is not human, they could get their salvation nullified. This truth of Christ's humanity seems so simple. By so vital to our salvation, we need to grasp this truth: Jesus is both human and divine. Jesus is both God and man. We must not think Jesus is half man and half God, or sometimes he is man and sometimes he is God. He is fully man and fully God since his conception. Let me give you a few verses to show that Jesus is both human and divine. John chapter one verse fourteen, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the One and Only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus became flesh. To be born in the flesh means He has flesh and blood, like you and me. His humanity can be seen by the fact that He felt hungry after forty days of fasting. He felt thirsty, so he asked a Samaritan woman for the drink, and he wept when his friend Lazarus died. Although he is born a man, he is also God, and has the nature of God. Let's see what God says about him when he was born. Hebrews chapter one verse six. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, "Let all God's angels worship him." Hebrews chapter one verse eight. But about the Son, he says, "Your throne, O God, will last for ever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom." God the Father calls Jesus God. Jesus' divinity is also seen by the fact that he didn't sin, 
and he performed miracles. He was born to the Virgin Mary, and so he was not tempted by the sinful nature of Joseph and Mary. He has been tempted like us, but he didn't sin. Jesus, humility is not temporary, restricted to his 33 years on earth. His humanity is permanent. When he rose from the dead, his body is a physical one, for he ate a fish before them. Luke chapter 24 verse 41 And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. Jesus is in heaven now, and he is still human. He still has a physical body. If by the grace of God, you can go to heaven and take a sample of his flesh and bring it down to earth for testing, you find that it is truly human. But there is a difference. It can't be destroyed by anything because it is a resurrected body. Jesus will keep his physical body throughout eternity. Early on, we have seen some false prophets deny the humanity of Jesus. That's one extreme. But there are other preachers who have gone to the other extreme. They thought that when Jesus came to earth, he set aside his divinity. He emptied himself of his divinity. According to them, during the period between his birth and his ascension, Jesus was not divine at all, but only human. So he completely depended on God. At first hearing, this teaching sounds profound or innovative, but it's wrong and it's fatal. Let me show you why it's wrong and it's fatal to our faith. If Jesus is not divine, why did the disciples worship him? Matthew chapter 14 verse 33 Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. If Jesus is merely a human being, he is not fully involved in the salvation plan. He can't die for our sins. A mere human being cannot bear the weight of the sins of anyone in the world. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. For him to be an effective mediator between God and man, he has to be both God and man. If Jesus has not been both God and man, our salvation will not be complete too. In other words, we won't have salvation at all. Before the paratroopers jump out of the aircraft, the commander will ask the paratroopers to check their parachutes. Then he and his officers will go down the lines to make sure they are strapped their parachutes properly. Imagine a paratrooper jumping with a parachute that's not properly tied. He'll be dead. We need to hold the truth of the humanity and divinity of Jesus firmly. Our salvation depends on our belief in this truth. If the prophet or the preacher denies the humanity or the divinity of Jesus, then leave him immediately. Don't say, He's not really bad. His members are very friendly. The church has very good social programs for the poor. They have a very good Sunday school program. If we were to test a piece of meat and find it stale, we shall not try the other pieces, thinking that they might be fresh. Let's read verse 4. You dear children are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The wonderful thing about the readers of John is that they are not deceived by the false prophets. They overcome the false prophets. How do they overcome? They are overcome by the one who lives in them. They have the Holy Spirit living in them. The Holy Spirit is a counselor, teacher, and guide into the truth. He helps them to discern what is right and what is wrong. Let's read verses 5 and 6. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. John teaches us to use the second test. The second test is to check the message or the content of the message. John says that the false prophets are from the world and speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. 
John describes the nature of the false prophet's message. It is worldly, it is very appealing to the non-believers, and it finds ready reception by the non-believers. But the non-believers will not accept the message of the genuine preachers. Only genuine believers will accept it. The false prophets will be more popular. The false prophets will have a bigger audience. What type of message will false prophets preach which will receive wide acceptance by the non-believers? John doesn't mention, but there could be messages that downplay sin or still affirm them despite their sinful living. Jude chapter 1 verse 4 For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago has secretly slipping among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus our only sovereign and Lord. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 13 to 14 From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. The false prophets will not preach about sin, repentance, judgment, deeper life, and holiness. These messages are hard and will drive the audience away. They will not gain any offerings or contributions. In the 1990s and the first decade of 21st century, many American churches adopted one kind of church growth method called the seeker-friendly church. Their intention was noble to win the non-believers, but the method was quite similar to an approach used by the false prophets, and it hurt the church. Pastors in seeker-friendly churches didn't preach about repentance, judgment of God, or personal holiness, because these messages are offensive to the non-believers. They preach messages that are friendly and relevant, success, prosperity, self-improvement, the blessings of God, the grace of God, and the unending love of God. Some churches grew after using the seeker-friendly approach, but it severely compromised the spirituality of the members. Many discerning or serious believers left for churches which preach the Bible as it is. In the year 2007, the Christian magazine Christianity Today carried a report where Bill Heibel, the guru of seeker-friendly church movement, admitted that studies have shown that seeker-friendly church have produced weak disciples or believers without strong foundations. When Paul went to Corinth, he brought the idol worshippers, the swindlers, the sexually immoral, the adulterers, the homosexuals, the drunkards, the thieves, and the slanderers to faith in Jesus. We can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. These were hardcore non-believers. How did Paul do it? I don't think it was because of his charisma or his public speaking skills. He neither looked impressive nor was he a talented speaker. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. How could he bring the hardcore non-believers to Christ? He preached about something hard and difficult for the sinners to hear. He preached about the death of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. He also preached about repentance and transformation. Acts chapter 26, verse 20 First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Paul was not afraid that he might drive away the non-believers, because he knew that the gospel has a power to convert even the hardest sinner. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The two tests of John, to test the messenger and to test the message, are not complete tests. John's tests are sufficient for his local context or his geographical area. 
The false prophets will operate among his readers, deny the humanity of Jesus, and teach things that appeal to the non-believers. Jesus prescribes another test. Check their character or behavior. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By the fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? If the preacher is a false prophet, it's only a matter of time before you find that things don't add up. You find him dishonest with finance. He cheats people of money. He will add inappropriately toward women. You find that he has frequent outbursts of anger or uses his anger to domineer people. There are two ways to discern prophecies. The first one is beware of prophets who give generalized prophecies. Like, a new season is coming. When my people will seek me, they will give themselves to me in a way they never did before. Or, I will do a new thing. I will shake the earth. It's very hard to evaluate generalized prophecies. There are always people seeking God. There are many things that can shake the earth. Earthquake, locusts, flood, and virus. The second way is to hold the word of God higher than prophecies. What do we do when the prophecies delivered by the prophets differ from what God has spoken to you through the Bible? I consider the word of God higher than prophecies, so I rely on the word of God rather than prophecy. Several years ago, I was at a crossroad. I've been seeking the Lord. I feel quite slowly that I should take a certain direction. One day I read a passage from the book of Zechariah. It spoke to me. I felt that it was a strong indicator for me to go ahead. Then a Christian sister approached me. She said that she had been praying for me. I have high respect for her. She said that I should not take that direction, but the other. I was taken aback. So I wondered whether I should listen to her or to the word of God. In the end, I decided to follow God's word and it proved to be right. Some Christians go for the fast and easy way. When they need a guidance, they ask the prophets to give prophecies to guide them. No, they should be seeking God, praying and reading the Bible. Whatever prophecy they are should confirm or complement what God has been speaking to them through the word, through the peace in their hearts, through the advice of other believers, and through the circumstances. Every church age has its heresy. Some heresies are very sophisticated. Satan is a very clever theologian, but a false one. Ultimately, some false prophets can only be detected by an excellent knowledge of the Bible. John MacArthur says that if we want to detect counterfeit money, the key lies not in studying counterfeit money, but in being familiar with genuine catch. When you know God's words, you can detect counterfeit prophecies and teachings. But spiritual literacy among many believers is extremely low. I think many Christians will fail even a simple Bible quiz. Many will enter heaven without even having read the New Testament once. Many Christians hardly read the Bible. Some read only one or two verses a day. Imagine a small boy eating only a small piece of biscuit every day for two years. How can he grow? In Ephesians, Paul asks us to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, so that we can stand when the day of evil comes. But when Satan comes to attack us, we can't take out the spiritual sword. We have only a penknife, so small and so short. The reason is that we don't read God's word. Satan only has to make a few tracks or say a few lies and we'll wobble or fall off our chairs. If you don't read the word of God, you are weak and in danger. You can easily fall victim to false prophets and false teachers. I want to challenge you to read the Bible seriously. We need to know the doctrines too. I have a friend, his son at the age of 19 read the book Systematic Theology by Van Gruden. The book has 1,214 pages. Your elders and leaders will age away. It's only a matter of time before you take over the leadership of the church. If you don't know God's words, how can you protect the members from the false prophets 
whom Jesus labeled as ferocious wolves. I hope you'll be enlightened and challenged. For a response on to the message, we will sing this, I believe, the creed. After the song, I will send the response and closing prayer. I believe in life eternal. I 
Lead us to say the response prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for speaking to us today. We realize that we are so immature and weak in our faith. We have been careless and we have not studied your word seriously. Please forgive us. We have set out to study your word. We want to grow and have strong foundations. When testing and temptations come our way, your word will be a guiding light and source of strength. Your word will give us hope and comfort during our trials. Your word will guide us to our path of righteousness, and with your word we will strengthen those who are weary and discouraged. Let your word keep us safe and give us inheritance among those who are sanctified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. 